River Shannon, the largest river in Ireland and one of the largest in Europe. A river that winds its way through Irish history and still carries on its banks reminders of the country's ancient past. But the Shannon has also played its part in the story of modern Ireland. When the native Irish government was established in 1922, one of its first tasks was to develop the natural power resources of the country. Power to light towns and villages, to bring the comforts of modern living into Irish homes. Power for industrial expansion and for farming. In a word, power to build the prosperity of a country planning once again to take a useful place among the free nations of the earth. The first step was taken in 1925 when work was begun on the Shannon Hydroelectric Station at Ardna Crusher. The station was at first equipped to produce 150 million units a year and there were some who shook their heads asking what a small country like ours would do with all this extra power. But as the pylons marched across the countryside, the demand for power kept pace and soon there was need for further and more ambitious plans. Today, the Electricity Supply Board has hydro stations on the rivers Liffey and Erne as well as on the Shannon. And others are being built on the River Lee in the south and the River Claddy in Donegal. Here at Kathleen's Fall on the River Erne in Donegal is one of the most recent to go into commission. As in all hydro stations, most of the activity here takes place behind the scenes. The fall of water down each of the huge pipes catches the blades of a turbine, making it spin like a well-whipped top. The shaft of the spinning turbine carries through to the generating machine on the floor above and provides the constant motion needed to create electrical power. The water works out of sight on the blades underground, spinning the shaft at more than 180 revolutions per minute. While in the generating machine on the floor above, the miracle is taking place. The creation of a mysterious power that no one quite understands but which has been tamed and harnessed and put to work. The use of electrical power, like charity, begins at home. The station control room is electrically operated and the huge machinery responds to these controls at the movement of a wrist. When the new hydro stations now being built are completed, 70% of the country's potential hydroelectric power will have been harnessed. But we are not blessed with sufficient water power. Even if all the available water were in use, it still wouldn't be nearly enough to supply all the power we need. We have little coal and no oil resources in Ireland. But we have got large areas of peat, traditionally used by the country people as domestic fuel. In recent years, large-scale development of these boglands has been carried out by the government-sponsored body Borsna Mona. We are now using this further means of producing power from our native resources. The first of a series of peat-fired stations began work at Port Harlington in 1950 and the second at Allenwood in 1952. The Allenwood station is at present the largest of its kind in Western Europe. On the adjacent bog, the turf is won by machinery during a production and harvesting season that lasts for about eight months. Scooped out of the earth, it has passed through a macerator and emerges on the opposite side for spreading. During the last season, in 1955, Borsnamona increased production to a million tons. About half of this output is intended for the power stations. After further drying treatment, the turf is eventually carried by rail direct to the nearby power station, which burns about 200,000 tons in a year. The five-ton wagons are lifted from the bogies and hoisted to the roof. At roof level, the wagon is carried forward and the turf tipped into a bunker where its own weight carries it downward, ready for use in the furnaces below takes almost 400 tons per day to keep a furnace going at full blast. For every ton consumed, the station produces about 800 units of electricity. Enough, that is, to keep a 100-watt lamp burning continuously for nearly a year. In a peat station, as in all fuel-burning stations, the furnaces serve to heat water. The water is turned to steam, which actually drives the turbines. The steam is then reconverted to water in a condenser and begins its journey again. A separate supply of water runs through the cooling pipes in the condenser. This water is carried from the cooling tower 
Having passed through the cooling pipes, it goes for recooling to the tower, which is the most familiar feature of these peat stations. This one is 250 feet high. More of these peat stations are now under construction. One is nearing completion at Furban in County Offaly, and there's another underway at Lanesborough in County Longford, while four smaller ones are being built at other points throughout the country. But meanwhile, the demand for power far exceeds the combined capacity of the existing hydro and peat stations, so there are others using imported fuel. The Pigeon House station in Dublin burns coal. This was one of the first power stations to be built in Ireland about 50 years ago, and from time to time, additional plant has been added. Years of dust from the coal yards hasn't improved this station's looks. A comparative youngster is the North Wall station, commissioned in 1948, and burning oil in place of coal. Yet another of these stations has recently gone into operation at Marina in Cork. This one is equipped to burn either coal or oil and began its working life in 1954. A similar type of station is now nearing completion at Rings End in Dublin. It is already partly in operation and will be contributing its full share to the national network in 1956. Situated on land that has been reclaimed from the sea, the buildings are supported on concrete piles. Some of these piles go down to a depth of 200 feet. The chimney, not to be outdone, rises to a height of 250 feet and is at present the tallest structure in Dublin. This will eventually be the largest of the generating stations. It takes about five years actually to build one of this type, so plans to keep up with the increasing demand for power must be made well in advance. The transmission and distribution of power over a nationwide network calls for highly skillful organization. It would be uneconomic to send power over long distances at the low voltage level required by the consumer, so the level is first stepped up at each generating station for a quick dispatch along the high tension cables. Business along these lines is strictly wholesale, with power transmitted at a pressure of 110,000 volts. The first stage of this journey ends at a large transformer station where the current is stepped down and redispatched in various directions at a lower voltage. This voltage is then further reduced at small automatic transformer stations in each distribution area before finally passing to the consumer. This transformer and switch station at Inchicor in Dublin is one of the key points in a nationwide system that operates at all times day and night. A system planned to anticipate the sudden rises and falls in consumer demand and to prevent any shortage or stoppage of the needed supply. High voltage power from a number of generating stations is received here. It can either be stepped down for distribution to the surrounding areas or redirected at the same high voltage to some other key center in the network. Under this system, there is no district depending solely on the services of one particular power station. The transmission of power could be a dangerous business, but there are machines to watch machines. Faults are reported to the control room by a system of automatic signals. In certain cases, the transformer switches automatically disconnect themselves. If there's a breakdown at any point, power is at once supplied from another source or along a different route. Only in rare cases is there a break in supply to the consumer. The panel here at Inchicore also provides remote control of two small hydro stations on the Liffey. The machinery at the two hydro stations, situated a number of miles away, responds to control from here in a matter of seconds. Behind this handsome Georgian facade in Dublin is the brain centre of the system, the load dispatch office, directing and coordinating all the work of generation and transmission. Here are planned the moves in a never-ending campaign to feed to all parts of the nation just as much power as is needed at any particular time. The demand for power varies according to the weather and according to the time of day. The output must be increased at the approach of each peak period, but to produce more than is needed would mean grave waste since this power cannot be stored. The capacity of some of the generating stations also varies at times, so that a highly flexible system is needed to keep a steady balance between supply and demand. A graph of the anticipated demand is plotted for each day based on the demand for the previous day, on weather forecasts and on a close study of our living habits. These habits vary with the seasons and on special occasions. The records show, for example, that on 
Since Stephen's day, most of us do without breakfast. Uh, probably because we don't want to spoil the lingering flavor of that nice Christmas dinner. It is from the low dispatch office that directions are sent to all stations over the teletype machine. Contact can also be made over a high-frequency telephone system operated along the high-tension cables. With this system, it's possible to bring in all the stations at once for a general conference. Although the staffs required at the various stations are small, there is need for many workers of different skills elsewhere. Altogether, the organization employs about 8,000 people. Keeping track of about half a million customers is a big undertaking in itself. Maintenance and repair over the wide network of cables provide plenty of healthy outdoor exercise and an opportunity to see things from a fresh viewpoint. Modern industrial expansion depends to a great extent on the supply of electrical power which must always keep one step in advance of the demand. The amount of power used per head of population is a measure of a country's industrial development. Although power forms only a tiny percentage of manufacturing costs, it's a vital need. The spread of electrification in Ireland has encouraged new industries and helped older ones towards greater efficiency. Many of these now compete successfully with rival firms abroad. Electrically powered factories can be operated far from cities and ports bringing useful employment to the local people's doorsteps. At present, industry uses about one-third of the total supply of power. Housewives use even more. About 40% of the total output is used in the home, where it plays an increasingly bigger part in banishing the old housekeeping drudgeries and establishing better standards of living. Cinderella wouldn't know herself in a modern all-electric kitchen. No cinders to cope with and thermostatically controlled cooking that can be left to look after itself while she attends to more important matters elsewhere. The glitter of bright city lights is a symbol of the 20th century. Lights that wink invitingly when we step out to enjoy ourselves. And you don't have to be a film star to get top billing these days. You want to see your name up in lights? Just say the word. Ireland, in proportion to its population, has a greater number of hospital beds than any other country in the world. These hospitals depend largely on electrical power for efficiency in the day-to-day -day routine. And of course, X-ray and a wide range of other indispensable aids to medical treatment would be quite impossible without it. Hotel and restaurant catering has also seen a change. The labor of preparing meals for a big number of people has largely been eliminated. Nowadays, Almost every task in the kitchen, from the preparation of the raw material to the cleaning of dishes when the food has been served, can be done electrically. New and improved aids to better catering are constantly being developed. Power has helped to change our way of life in so many respects that we have long ago taken it for granted. Radio Aaron, here is the weather forecast for the rest of the day. Weak troughs of low pressure are approaching our... Even here in the cinema, we accept the pictures thrown by electric light from the projection room just as naturally as these hothouse plants accept the warmth of the electrically heated soil. In 1946, one of the most important pieces of our national planning was put underway when work was begun on rural electrification. This is a scheme to bring the benefits of power to the large but scattered communities living outside the towns and villages. A large undertaking, it involves the raising of one and a half million poles to carry thousands of miles of cable. This rural network will eventually supply over a quarter million farms and other dwellings. More than a third of these consumers have already been connected, and working parties are constantly in action, pushing the job to completion in all parts of the country. The scheme will mean an easier way of life in rural homes and not only by giving heat and light. The drudgery of pumping and carrying water will gradually disappear as the electric pump brings modern sanitation to thousands of isolated dwellings. 
A good supply of water is useful for all sorts of jobs on the farm, and here again, the electric pump plays an important part. Quite apart from the saving in labor, a plentiful helping of water actually increases production among dairy cattle and other farm stock. There's a wide variety of electrical equipment for use in dairy and other farming, and many Irish farmers are now taking full advantage of it. The infrared lamp has solved the old problem of providing warmth at a reasonable cost for the rearing and fattening of pigs. In poultry farming too, ideal conditions for hatching and rearing can be created at the turn of a switch. Fortunately, hens are not very quick on the uptake and are still taken in by electric light that keeps them at work long after the hours laid down by their union. Other uses for electrical power on the farm range from welding jobs to the drying of grain after harvest. Agriculture is the basis of our economy and this new aid to farming efficiency is helping to win that increased production on which our well-being finally depends. The foresight and enterprise that planned this scheme of national electrification 30 years ago is still needed today as we move even further from the old traditional ways into an age of new developments and new techniques. In the new era, new power stations and networks will continue to anticipate the nation's needs in agriculture and industry because now more than ever before our prosperity depends on progress and progress depends on power.